And we are live. Hello, Photopillars. Rafael Dabar here. And welcome to another masterclass. Today, we're going to learn how to photograph the birthdays with Ian Norman. Ian, how are you, man? Hey, everyone. Hey, Rafa. It's good to see you. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad you're here with us today and really looking forward to learning birthdays. So, meet the shelf photography with you, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Um, it, you know, uh, I haven't been out shooting in a little while, especially from the pandemic. And so I'm excited at the opportunity of uh, being able to go out and, you know, and shoot the Perseids next week. So, yeah. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. For the people that doesn't know who Ian Norman is, um, who are you and show us, talk uh, about, about a bit about you and what do you do? Uh, so uh, my wife, Diana, and I started a website called lonelyspec.com. And lonelyspec.com is all about night photography, just uh, uh, everything night photography. Um, and we write tutorials and basically try to create resources and tools for, uh, especially for beginners, uh, to learn astrophotography. Um, we especially love landscape astrophotography and uh, you know capturing scenes of the earth with the night sky, um, shooting the Milky Way and shooting the stars. Um, so loneliestspec.com, we started in uh, 2013, and mm -hmm. ever since then, we've sort of been building a community there, um, just centered around uh, astrophotography. All of our tutorials are free, and, um, you know, we're just trying to make the best resource that we can uh, online for anybody wanting to learn how to shoot photographs of the stars. Yeah, um, definitely, man. I mean, uh, long spec when we started, you know, photo pills, believe it or not, you were a great inspiration for us because we learned so much. Oh, about thank you. Photography from your blog uh, and this. Uh, definitely, guys, if I suppose that everybody like that has, that is watching us know Lonely Spec and Ian Norman, but if you don't know it, go and go and check uh, longspec.com. It's an amazing resource for uh, astrophotography and uh, photography in general. Thanks, Rafa. Yeah, so I figured that maybe we'd start off a little bit um, and just show a few of the photos that uh, awesome. I've made recently, some of the projects yeah. that I've been working on. Um, this particular shot was actually shot uh, in the basically the home of photo pills in Menorca, <laughs> uh, Spain. Um, Diana and I went to the photo pills camp uh, last year in 2019 and uh we're uh one of the nights i um pointed this my camera to one of my favorite parts in the night sky called uh the ro ofiyuki cloud complex it's one of the most colorful parts of the night sky um and uh so that you know th this is this is kind of more uh in, in tune with what we think of astrophotography it being in the traditional sense, sort of just photos of stars and nebula and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that this astrophotography, while it can be really beautiful, is is maybe uh, it, it lacks a certain connection, I think, with the Earth. So um, that's where I wanted to sort of move on and, and show uh, some of the work that's a little bit more in tune with uh, what most of Lonely Spec is about, and that is photographing uh, the Milky Way with the Earth in the foreground. Um, this is uh, also shot uh, kind of near Menorca um, on the mainland in Andorra, which is a small country just north of Spain. Um, and uh, you know, it's the Milky Way rising up over the uh, uh, what is it, the Pyrenees? There is that correct? The Pyrenees, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, you know, so this is a, a lot more like what the, the type of content we love talking about on Lonely Spec. And most of the photographs that um, I've personally been working on lately um, are made with a special technique called panorama stitching, where I'm using a, a fairly long lens. So I'll shoot on like a hundred millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, normally used for like portraits or, um, you know, studio or sports work. And I'll shoot a mosaic of multiple images to, to come up with a really, really high resolution photograph. So this photograph that you guys are looking at is actually almost 500 megapixels in size. So it's very, very high resolution. Um, and so I've been working on this technique just for the last uh, couple of years now. 
um, making uh, photographs are, are anywhere between 500 megapixels um, up to almost one gigapixel in size. Um, wow. I, I've really, really enjoyed doing this method a lot. It's, it's a little bit time consuming, um, but um, I think it's sort of like worth the trade off and the effort. Definitely a more advanced technique, not something I'd recommend for a beginner. Um, but if you've sort of dipped your feet into astrophotography and you really want to um, get started on, on drastically improving like the resolution and the, the quality of your photographs, then um, I think it's a, a really fun technique to try. And I have a tutorial on Lonely Spec um, that outlines everything that I do to create these really, really high resolution astrophotos. Um, awesome. If you, you want, we can leave a link in the description on this video to, the, to the, that tutorial. That would be great. Uh, yeah, sure. I can. Uh, is is that something that we can do uh, like after the stream or, or can I do that live? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. No problem. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, these are these are just the types of photographs that uh, we love to take. Um, uh, Diana and I also uh, we've recently started a project building a camper van. Um, we're actually pretty much finished with it. There's a few finishing touches on it, um, and that's basically what we would have been doing had there not been a pandemic. Um, we'd be touring around the United States uh, in our camper van, shooting the stars. We're really hoping to be able to, to do a little bit of that um, before the end of the summer this year, um, depending on on how we can uh, manage our travel. Um, but you know, this is sort of what we live for: going out, being under the stars, and uh, capturing it. You know, for for others to see. It sounds like <laughs> a great plan, man. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so we're right now located. Um, we're located in Chicago. Um, that's kind of like our home base uh, in the United States. And uh, believe it or not, you can actually photograph. Uh, you know, the Milky Way and the stars, um, only just a few hours away from a big city. This is actually only um, about two hours from uh, downtown Chicago um, in a little wildlife preserve. And this is actually the location that we're gonna uh, be showing you on our plan for uh, shooting the Perseids. So um, Diana and I are gonna go out there next week to hopefully capture the meteor shower. Um, and this is the location that we're gonna be shooting from. Um, this particular shot was made in January of this year, um, showing uh, the or Orion, uh, all the nebula around the Orion constellation, and um, you know some of the sort of like winter night sky. Um, and this also is a, a very high resolution panorama, um, something like right. 500 megapixels. So, where is, where is Orion there? You... Um, or, yeah, Orion is is is. Right here, this sort of pink spot that you see, um, this is a very, very wide field of view. It's um, it's about the equivalent field of view of like a, using a 12 millimeter lens on a full frame mm -hmm. camera. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can see, if you look right, kind of in this area, there's three stars there that are the staple Orion's belt. Um, and then uh, below it is the bright Orion nebula. And Orion has uh, all kinds of cool like gases and stuff around it. Um, there's this big, Kind of reddish loop that the c-shaped loop called barnard's loop um, and then there's this little uh this like red spot called the angelfish nebula and there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there as well there's a tutorial on lonely spec for uh, specifically about photographing the orion uh like cloud complex like capturing all of the different nebula um uh around the orion uh constellation nice nice beautiful <laughs> So of course we're here to talk about something else, and that is meteors uh, and meteor showers. We have the Perseid meteor shower that's coming up um, August twelfth, thirteenth, uh, depending on where you are. Um, here it's peaking, I think, on the twelfth. That basically uh, the, the night of of August eleventh, uh, transitioning into like you know midnight of the of August twelfth is is when uh, when we plan to go out and shoot. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, this particular um, set of photographs that I made <clears throat> from a past year meteor shower. These are actually the gemmated meteors, but um, a lot of the conditions that I encountered during uh, this meteor shower that I'm showing you um, are going to be fairly similar um, to mm -hmm. what we'll, we'll have on uh, 
on August uh, 12th of this year. So, uh, you know, I think this will be like a pretty good demonstration of uh, of what we can uh, what we wow. can expect. Yeah. So uh, these photographs were made in California um, mm -hmm. from a place called Red Rock Canyon State Park, and it's uh, just a couple hours north of Los Angeles. Um, it's a little bit light polluted. It's definitely not like the best dark sky location, um, but it's adequate for, you know, especially for doing something like me a meteor shower. Um, the Geminids, uh, Geminid meteor shower is usually in December. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, the Perseid meteor shower is in August. And, um, but the, they tend to be, e each of those tends to be like basically the two kind of like best meteor showers of the year, um, I think. Uh, At least for, for the Northern Hemisphere, they, yeah. are, they are the most powerful, I think, yeah. Right. The Quadrant did also are great, but... Yeah. So, um, one well, of the what, things... What's that, uh, that light that you have on the wall? I mean, it's, I feel like it is a dark... Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So, yeah. I, I showed you this, uh, the first photograph was very dark, um, mm -hmm. and that was before the moon rose, so, you know, oh. we were getting super dark, dark conditions. Um, and then the moon started rising and it was, uh, it was about, um, a half illuminated moon, about 50%, you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. um, illuminated moon and it rose around midnight and then started lighting up the tops of those cliffs. Um, so that's what that light is from is actually from the moon, uh, lighting up the cliffs. And, uh, the cool thing about uh, showing you these two photographs is that's almost exactly the conditions that we're going to have next week during the Perseids, the beginning of the night. Uh, from sunset until about midnight-ish, depending on where you are, uh, will be dark. There will be no moon in the sky. And then uh, right around the middle of the night, the moon will start to rise uh, mm -hmm. and will start, you know, it'll it'll turn the sky blue slightly in your photographs. It'll start illuminating the landscape. And so, um, you know, I think the photographs that I made um, and that will demonstrate uh, the processing of uh, will be a pretty good example of what you guys can expect if you actually go out shooting next week and and trying to capture the Perseid meteor shower. That's going to be great because today we're going to see the whole process from the idea, the planning, the gear, how to take the photo, and also a bit of you know the post processing, which is so important with the meteor shower photography. That's going to be great. Yeah, I'm um, excited. So do we want to go ahead and and kind of uh, take a look at the plan that I have for the Perseids? Sure, sure. Okay, Let's so go uh, I'm going to pull up um, on the computer here. Let's see if I can find a plan. And okay, here we go. So uh, right now, you guys are looking at my phone screen, and I have the Photo Pills app open. Um, and uh, so I've put together a plan in Photo Pills using the, the planner function. So I'll open that uh, right now. And uh, just to sort of give you some context of what we're looking at, I'm going to zoom out and I'll turn off the Milky Way visibility here. Um, so if I zoom all the way out, um, I've got the red pin positioned um, just west of Chicago. This is about two hours away from Chicago. Um, there's a small wildlife preserve. Um, and that's the photograph that I showed earlier in the stream um, of the sort of like country road and uh, the Orion uh, constellation, uh, it was shot at that red pin location. So um, that's the location that I wanna go shoot. So zooming in there, um, you can sort of see this green area. It's called the Green River uh, Wildlife Management Area. Um, and it's one of the few places that you can go you know, at night and uh, it's fairly dark because it's away from the city and um, this, this is something to sort of keep in mind for if you do plan to go out for the Perseids is find uh, a public space that's open at night. Um, also one that is open, you know, I mean, the pandemic has closed uh, certain public lands and stuff like that. So definitely check the website of the location or maybe give the office a call and see if they have any, uh, you know, closures or, or, you know, see what you can do. Make sure you can go there at night. Um, and uh, I know that this place um, is, uh, open as far as I know. Um, and uh, there's a lot of, you know, farmland and stuff around the area. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's relatively dark, definitely not the darkest uh, location in, in, uh, uh, in the world, that's for sure. <laughs> um, 
So uh, there's a few things that I wanted to talk about um, on photo pills. Um, you know, I think Rafa will definitely want me to mention here um, about some of the tools that they've integrated for planning meteor showers specifically. Um, and I have those enabled right now. If we, if we look at this top bar, I can sort of swipe uh, uh, left and right on it and enable and disable certain things. And if you kind of swipe all the way over um, to the right here, there's uh, the meteor shower um, tool. And uh, right now I have the Perseids enabled and you can actually uh, tap to enable and disable it. And when you uh, add a meteor shower to the planner, you have uh, the option to select uh, any of the meteor showers uh, for any year, um, which is really great. And so obviously we're talking about uh, the current one, which is, which is the Perseids. Um, so once I tap that, then it adds a few different things to the planner to help you um, figure out when the best time is to, uh, to go out and shoot. Um, it also automatically advances the date to the, uh, to the peak, I believe, yes. uh, when you select it, yeah. Um, so it advanced it to um, midnight of uh, like midnight uh, and and ten minutes of um, the twelfth of August, um, and uh, that that is the night that uh, we plan on going out. So it's 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 the night of the eleventh uh, to the the twelfth, um, and uh, so there's a, a couple things that it adds to the uh, to the planner. Uh, one of them is in the actual planner view. There's, uh, if you look in here, there's this little black circle here and it has like a little symbol of the meteors on it. And that is showing us the, the position, like sort of like the compass position of where the meteors will be uh, uh, radiating from. So it's, it's the point uh, at which all the meteors will appear to travel from in the sky. Um, that's not necessarily the, um, where they'll be in the sky, but it, it's the point at which it'll appear that they're traveling from, if that makes any sense. Um, 100%. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, and the cool thing about it is if we, if we scroll on the timeline and select a different time of night, we can see that that position, the, the radiant point changes its position through the night. And that just has to do with the rotation of the earth. So as the earth rotates, that radiant point is sort of moving around the sky, and uh, you know it, it'll change its relative position uh, to where we're pointing our camera. Um, so that's the first thing that it adds. So it at least gives us a direction of where we should face. So I know that if if I'm shooting during like the the really peak part of the night, right near midnight, that the radiant point of the meteors is actually going to be um, just a little bit above the horizon. And it looks like sort of to the the northeast. And as long as I'm pointing my camera in that direction, I should be able to to get the radiant point of the meteors. Um, so that's that's a, a really really nice feature that they've added into PhotoPills. Uh, you know, super cool to see. Um, yeah, that, uh, definitely because you know uh, some people wants to uh, create these composite images afterwards. You know, with, with all the meteors pointing in to the radiant in the sky. So right. it's important. You want to create uh, this kind of uh, this uh, kind of images. You need to really, you know, uh, put the radiant in the frame when you're shooting, so that that's uh, a great tool to have. It's uh, really easy to to understand on the map. It's uh, it's great. Right. So the next thing um, uh, that I think is really cool, and it's uh, it's kind of down on the bottom here. Um, let me see if I, I don't know if I can. I guess I can't really. I'm trying to see if I can zoom in on the stream, uh, but if you look. Do you mean you look, the, the, gray, the gray area? Right, yeah, for the gray area, yeah. So um, if we look down at the very bottom on this timeline that I'm moving back and forth, um, you can see that there is just sort of like a little uh, gray section of the graph. And that's highlighting the visibility of the meteors and how much visibility you can expect to have. And you can see that it starts low in the, in the beginning part of the night, and it gradually increases to a peak. Uh, and then it starts to lower again, and then increases to a second peak. And that has to do with a couple different things. Well, for one, the meteors are, going, are becoming um, more and more active throughout the night. So you know, as, as the night goes on, uh, we'll be able to see them more and more. And also, the, the skies are getting darker and darker. So that helps with the visibility of those meteors. Um, but the other thing that happens right around midnight, this little drop, um, 
that drop is in there because the moon is rising. So the photopills team actually um, figured out that the visibility of the meteors um, is affected by the moonlight, and they added that to that graph. So you can sort of expect, expect like a sort of dip in the visibility of the meteors um, midway through the night. Um, so you know this sort of gives us an idea, like okay, if we want uh, to be able to shoot, then we need to be able to uh, to, to shoot during the, um, the the beginning part of the night uh, through till. Uh, around midnight in order to get the absolute best, uh, you know, frequency of meteors with the darkest skies. And then we should expect it so, to sort of dip off a little bit later in the night just because the moon is rising. Um, so that's a really cool thing to look at. And the, the interesting thing about it too is we can actually scroll over to the next day or the next evening and we can see that it has a very similar get, uh, graph. Um, so there, there is a, a sort of like a, another shooting section that we have um, as indicated by this sort of gray section of this graph. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a really, really cool uh, feature just to sort of help plan the best nights. And if, if we go like several days farther, we can see that that gray graph gets, gets really, really small because we're now leaving the peak time of the calendar for the Perseid meteor shower. Um, so th that'll definitely help you plan the best night that, um, you know, for, for shooting the meteors. Uh, yeah, very, very do, cool. do you suggest uh, to shoot uh, throughout the whole night or just, uh, yeah I would, I would suggest um, shooting the whole night if you can afford to, to stay up that late um, <laughs> it's <Bring coffee. laughs> yeah um, so meteor showers are kind of fickle um, you know the best we have is is statistics to try and like understand when the best time might be but it you know I mean they're uh, they're a natural phenomenon, so they, you know, they vary in in their intensity. You know, even though it might be like right on the peak of what is predicted, um, you know, it 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 could be a little bit better later. It could be a little bit better earlier. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where, uh, in order to really successfully capture a meteor shower, it's best to shoot as much of the night as you possibly can. Um, mm -hmm. to get the best chances of capturing them. Um, to give you an example of that, um, if, we, if we go back actually to um, that photograph that I, I showed before, um, oh, I need to exit full screen here. So if, if we look at this photograph um, that I showed you guys before, uh, there's about 20 meteors in there. There's some fairly dim ones that might not be as visible, um, but I captured about 20 meteors that night in a single, uh, uh, composition, but it didn't take a single exposure to capture all 20 of those meteors. Um, I actually had to shoot about 200 exposures um, over a very long period of the night in order to capture that many meteors. So this is actually a sort of compilation. It's a composite of uh, all of the best frames that I found for that night. Um, and, uh, you know, each one, uh, you know, I selected each one with a meteor. Um, so when you see a photograph of a meteor shower and it has multiple meteors in it all radiating from a point or, you know, like this where they're all, you know, all in the same frame, um, that photograph is pretty much always a composite of a, a long portion of the night, you know, so it's sort of capturing uh, where all those meteors were um, for that particular night. So, um, so that's something that we need to keep in mind. Just like we're trying to maximize our ability to capture the meteors, so we need to shoot as as long as possible during the night. Uh, that's cool. And how do you find these locations? Because you know, I suppose one of the key parts is scouting and finding cool locations. And then, of course, the locals can tell you, you know, for that location uh, when you should be there to to shoot. Uh, but for example, this this, this composition is great, and uh, yeah. The, the foreground is king, right? When too much right. to put in the sky. Right, right. Um, yeah, know, it's actually for like any process on scouting or um, you yeah, that? so I, I tend to like to use um, well, there's a few different things. Um, I mean, Google Maps obviously, um, as yeah. like initial scouting. So looking for those uh you know, those green areas on the map usually, you know, like public lands, um, forest lands, natural preserves, stuff like that. Um, that tends to be a good way of doing it. Um, in the United States in particular, 
uh, most public lands are open at night. And so that, that ends up being like the first, you know, go-to place anywhere with camping that's open. You know, if, if the campground is open, then you you obviously can be there at night. So, you know, paying the camping fee and, and finding a spot, you know, that can be a really great way to do it. Um, this particular location, actually, um, the Red Rock Canyon State Park has a campground at it. So it's a really you know easy place to be able to stay over at night. Um, but yeah, that's, that's honestly like the, the very first thing that I do, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, especially in the United States, like, um, you know, we don't have any, we don't have like that law that they have in Norway, which basically says that you can just roam anywhere and, and just be there because yeah. it, I, I forgot the name of it. It's a really cool law that they have in Norway where you can like basically traverse across private property if you need in order to access, uh, public lands. Um, and that doesn't exist in the United States. You know, you have to be wary of what's private land and what's not. Um, and so, yeah, the, the safest bet is to definitely look for, uh, you know, publicly accessible lands on Google Maps. Yeah. Uh, so you do your, your, yeah. your research online and then I suppose when you find a uh, location, it's all about, you know, getting there a few days earlier and explore and fine tune your planning and find your composition. Exactly, yeah. And, um, you know, when it when it does come down to finding, um, you know, m maybe you're trying to figure out like, okay, I want to, you know, look towards the radiant point. Um, you know, this is sort of going back to uh, what we were showing on on uh, yeah. on photo pills. Um, you know, perhaps there's something that you want to include in your photograph at that particular location. And I know that. Um, so if I zoom in here, let's see if I can uh, kind of show it. I'm going to change the map to uh, satellite here. And um, so kind of looking in on the map here uh, in this location. So I have it on the Green River uh, like visitor center there. Um, but my actual shooting location, I want it to be kind of up here on this road. And uh, so, so I, I sort of actually plan on, uh, let's see if I can put the, put the red pin there. So I plan on standing on this road mm -hmm. um, and I wanna shoot kind of towards the indicator here um, mm -hmm. to the north. And um, you know, I know that in the beginning of the night, the radiant point um, of, uh, of the, the meteors is gonna be fairly far north. So I should be able to capture that in my frame mm -hmm. um, so right when it gets, you know, when it gets super dark around, you know, 10 p.m., 11 p.m. and midnight, um, as long as I'm sort of pointing toward the north, I should be able to get that radiant point in, in the, the, the right side of my image. Um, and one of the things I like to do, you know, once I'm there, once I'm like at the location, um, you know, maybe the sun is coming down and I'm sort of trying to figure out where I want to stand. And I don't really know, you know, maybe exactly where to look. Um, Photopills has, you know, obviously the, the night AR mode, and, and that's something I can show here. Um, I'm just going to show it from my seat. So see yeah, if I enable yeah. this. Okay, you guys can see my my laptop and everything. And this is this is just our our living area. Um, <laughs> assume assume I'm outside and uh, I want to figure out where the radiant point of the Perseids are. I can just aim my my uh, phone around, and it says, "Okay, the Perseids are going to be over there, over by our projector screen." Um, so I know, you know, when I'm when I'm standing outside, that oh, I just point my camera, you know to include that point in the sky and that's where the Perseids will be. Um, so yeah. that's, that's a, you know, an excellent tool, um, uh, that, that Photopills has in there using that night AR mode. Um, so that's, that's one of my favorite things about Photopills. Honestly, it's like, it's like, huh, where should I point my camera? <laughs> okay. Night AR mode. Oh, there's the radiant point or, Oh, there's where the Milky Way is going to be. Um, and all those things are highlighted on Night AR, um, one of the coolest tools in PhotoPills for sure. That was great. I mean, I think we have a plan, right? You, you know, yeah, yeah, on, the, on the 11th? Plan. plan, yeah. 11, so, 19, uh, and you know where the rainy is, that was a shooting spot. And it's all about getting there uh, before sunset, I suppose, and you know, maybe adjust the compo, and that's it, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I figured we, we'd probably want to um, go, you know, okay, we've got our plan. Um, you know, what are we going to bring? 
Uh, like yeah. what should we make sure that we have with us to maximize, you know, our, our ability to capture those meteors? Um, so I figured we'll go ahead and switch over from screen sharing mode here. I'm gonna um, stop my screen share. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the gear that we like to use um, and what you guys should think about when you are going out for uh, uh, shooting meteors, you know, what you should bring with you. Um, first and foremost, obviously, is a camera. Um, so uh, Diana and I shoot on Sony cameras. Um, we shoot on, this is the A7 Mark III, uh, which is like a full frame mirrorless camera. Um, you don't need to have the fanciest camera to go out, but we would suggest that you use, you know, an interchangeable lens camera, like a Canon DSLR, uh, a Nikon, um, you know, uh, Sony, Olympus, Panasonic, Pentax, whatever, you know, Fujifilm, uh, something any, where you can... Any camera, any camera is good? Yeah, Full pretty... Crop, sensor camera? Um, I would, I would suggest, you know, um, Usually, like a, a good sweet spot, at, I would suggest probably micro four thirds and larger sensors if you can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I, I don't think you should just go out and drop, you know, three thousand dollars on a brand new camera just for the Perseids. Um, you know, shoot with what you have if you can, um, and uh, you know, d don't let the gear be the the thing that prevents you know. Feels like, oh, you know, my old Canon Rebel is so old, I shouldn't even bother, don't do that. Like, go out with your camera, go out with what you have, um, because it'll probably work just fine. Uh, you just need to make sure that it has, you know, the manual exposure mode. So you want to make sure that it has, you know, the, the mode dial so you can select uh, manual mode. Um, and, uh, you know, an interchangeable lens on it is super helpful because you want to you wanna be able to select a lens that has a very wide field of view, if possible. Um, since meteors are uh, kind of fickle and, you know, you never know where they're going to be in the sky, the best thing to do equipment-wise is to just make sure you have as wide of an angle lens as possible. Like the shortest focal length, widest angle lens that you have. Um, this lens is a, uh, an 18 millimeter um, so on full frame, that's pretty wide. That's, uh, I, I think, uh, like a hundred degrees of field of view, um, from corner to corner. Um, so it's considered like a super wide angle. Um, and they make, you know, even wider angle lenses, you know, 14 millimeters or even 12 millimeter lenses that are just, you know, really massive, uh, fields of view. Um, a fisheye lens is actually not a bad idea for shooting meteors because, you know, like I said, we're just trying to capture as much of the sky as possible. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, that's what we shoot on. So this is the 18 millimeter Zeiss Battis lens and then the Sony a7 Mark III. Um, and, uh, yeah, so first step camera wide angle lens, um, preferably one that has a fairly low F number, you know, uh, F 2.8 or F 1.4, if you have it. Um, the next, uh, most important thing, obviously uh is a tripod so we're going to be shooting uh we're going to be shooting long exposures right and uh we want our camera to just sort of be in one spot you know for our, our you know find our composition in the early part of the night and leave it there and just shoot the whole night that's that's what meteor shower shooting is all about um so uh tripod got the photo pills uh shout yeah. out on there those are the, the stickers that you got from the Photopill scan, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we need to be talking together in the US, man. <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, tripod wise, you know, I, I honestly, like, you know, it doesn't really matter what you use. Uh, I, you know, we, we have carbon fiber tripods. I like them. They don't get super cold at night, uh, you know, because they're essentially plastic. Um, so if you're carrying them around, you know, like having an aluminum tripod in bare hands is like really, really cold. Lighter weight too. I have a special head on here. This is actually uh, for my panorama shooting, um, but a regular ball head is perfect. Um, that, that's all what I would recommend just for fast composition. Having to fiddle with something like this is maybe not the best uh, example, but um, yeah, so regular tripod. Um, and then, of course, we need to be able to see in the dark. So a headlamp uh, is essential. 
Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, if you're walking around at night and you're trying to, to handle your camera, um, you know, and you're fiddling around with a tripod, you can't, you can't handle a camera and hold, uh, you know, a flashlight or torch, like, you know, and manipulate things when one of your hands is, is being used by the flashlight. So, um, headlamp is essential. Um, I just said, this is just a really small, cheap, you know, black diamond headlamp. Um, and then the most important thing for, uh, for a meteor shower is to get one of these. Um, and that's an interval timer. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason I say that this is the most important thing is, is, uh, this is what sort of separates just regular nighttime shooting where we can press the button, um, and being able to essentially record a time lapse. So when we're doing meteor showers, um, we want to set up our camera to record uh, a whole bunch of consecutive frames, uh, one after another over the course of the night. Like I said in my demo shot, which I'll show you later, I shot over 200 photographs, and I did that using one of these. Um, it plugs into your camera, and it has uh, a little built-in clock there. You can see it's set to 20 seconds right now. Um, and that right there is an interval between shots. So every 20 seconds, it'll press the shutter for me. And mm -hmm. so I would usually program, like in my case, I think I, I used, I don't know, we'll look at the EXIF data of the shot, um, but I used something around 15 seconds. And uh, so I would wanna set an interval just slightly longer than 15 seconds, something like 20, maybe 17 seconds or something. Um, yeah. And yeah. make sure yeah. that it's, do you suggest a delay, like, you know, you have your exposure time and then a one, two seconds delay between the shot? Um, yeah, in general, like if, um, it doesn't matter as much on modern cameras, but there's some like weird timing things that cameras do. And so I usually suggest two seconds longer than your shutter time. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about the shutter times um, uh, right, after, uh, right after I talk about uh, gear here. Um, but yeah, so I would usually set it two seconds longer than your shutter time. So if your shutter time is 15 seconds, you can set your interval to 17 seconds, and that, that should be pretty good um, you know, for, for being able to shoot uh, through the whole night. Now, um, something to also consider, um, another like option, and I'll, I'll mention this again when I talk about camera settings, is you could put your camera on continuous shutter mode, You know, the mode where if you were to hold down the shutter, it would just fire yeah. a bunch of photos off. If you enable that mode um, and you have a simpler just trigger, oftentimes the triggers they'll have um, they'll have a, a button that you can slide up, and what that'll do is that'll act as if you're continuously holding the shutter. It, it's usually labeled hold as you know as if you're holding the shutter, and so what that'll do is if you have continuous shutter mode enabled, it'll just take photos as often as it possibly can, and that's sort of like a simpler way of uh, of shooting a time lapse like this, uh, just as as fast as you possibly can without having to program the interval. Um, that it could present some problems if you do rely on that because if your camera's not fast enough to save the files, um, hmm. it'll start sort of backing up and may, it might have you know longer delays between it. But it should still work, you know, for most modern cameras. Most most modern cameras are fast enough to keep up, uh, especially if your photographs are like. 15 seconds long, that should be enough time for it to save while it's exposing the next shot. So um, so I, I think that's basically it in terms of gear. Definitely remember an interval timer. Some cameras have them built in too. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of modern cameras have a time-lapse mode or an interval timer function in the menu. So you know, take a look at your, uh, your, your camera uh, instruction booklet and see if it's in there, you know, browse through the menus and see if you can find it, because a lot of modern cameras already have it built in. Um, so you might not have to go buy an interval timer before the Perseids, so definitely uh, check that out. Yeah. And what about the filters? Because, uh, I mean, we're using your uh, Pure 9 filter for, you know, uh, mm -hmm. against light pollution here, it's super useful. Are you going yeah. to be planning to use it for? Yeah, you know, so, um, so um, on LonelySpec.com, uh, we, we actually manufacture and sell um, this thing. It's called the Pure Night. Um, it's a simple square filter, and it fits into a, a filter holder, uh, which I can show you here. I um, actually have one uh, in here. Let me pull it out. So um, this is a square filter holder, 
And it's a simple uh, frame that fits uh, onto the front of a lens. Um, so you screw it onto the front of the lens and it gives you these slots in order to fit a filter in. And mm -hmm. so the, the Pure Night is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a square filter and it just sort of slots in. Um, and this is a light pollution filter. So it, it filters out a lot of the sort of like orange, ugly glow um, that you get from cities. Um, so, it, you know, any of the orange colored lights that sort of turn the sky kind of with like this brown color, um, it, it filters that out and it usually gives you a little bit better contrast in the night sky. Um, and it can definitely be helpful in sort of like a suburban uh, setting where you're, you know, like in the case of our plan, where I'm only going to be two hours away from downtown Chicago. So there's still a lot of light pollution. Um, and uh, this, so this is definitely something that I would, I would put on there. Um, so you can check those out on lonelyspec.com. Um, Definitely, uh, and we're we're using actually uh, uh, Antonio Cladero, the photographer of our team. I mean, he's super happy with your filter. Filter here in Menorca, we have light pollution from uh, the urban areas and also from our neighbor island, Mallorca. And uh, uh, this filter, it's really it really gives great results. Is you, know, you get a much darker sky, and it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's why we that's why we made it. Um, yeah. I mean, you were the first ones to create this filter. We I mean, were, yeah. We we sort me, of had the uh, yeah. yeah we had the market for several years before uh, filter companies started copying us. Yeah, uh, I mean, so <laughs> if you want the original and you want the hundred percent guarantee with it, then you know you can go buy our filter. That's what uh, I mean. Yeah. You know, uh, being able to create something that doesn't exist and that really helps. I mean, of course, everybody will copy you afterwards, but uh, yeah, that makes you big. I mean, that makes you great. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. It was a fun project. I'm glad that we we did that. Um, yeah, first a little background, like uh, just for our viewers. I am an engineer, um, and so like the opportunity to create like a product um, centered around my passion, which is photography, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, was you know really really fun. And so you know that's one of the pro products that we. Uh, ended up developing uh, to hopefully make you know people's time shooting night photography better. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this other one that we make. Uh, we have another filter. Uh, really? I'll talk about that in a little bit um, when we talk about focusing. So uh, I'm going to share my screen again. I've got a couple slides because I want to talk about um, you know you know once you have all your gear, you're at your spot. Uh, what are the settings that you need to have on your camera in order to really get the best results? So. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and, and open that up. So uh, I'll share my screen here. Yes. Yeah, you are. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, we're we're seeing your screen. Yep. Um, uh, present. Okay. So uh, so we just went over the basic equipment. Here it is on a list, essentially. So your DSLR, wide-angle lens, headlamp, tripod, and an interval timer. Uh, pretty straightforward. Now, uh, the first question that we're going to get is like, you know, what what, what kind of exposure uh, would you suggest? Um, the shooting meteors is very similar to doing something like shooting the Milky Way. The settings are pretty much the same, at least what I would recommend. Um, and uh, these settings should work pretty much in any situation where you have reasonably dark skies. If you're, you know, in in a suburban area to you know extremely dark, you know, rural. Uh, desert or something like that. These settings should work pretty much every time. Um, since we're shooting on a wide angle lens, uh, I recommend a shutter time around 20 seconds, uh, 20 to 30 maybe. Um, that should be long enough for us to capture plenty of light and it should be short enough that we're not going to blur, start blurring the stars. Um, so that's sort of like a sweet spot. I think in the the example that I gave, I, my photo, or my exposure was around 15 seconds or so. We'll, we'll find out. Um, an aperture should be a low F number if possible. Um, the, the lowest F number that your, your camera has is what I say, or your lens has is what I would suggest. Um, so in this case of the, <clears throat> the lens that I showed you guys earlier, it's an F2.8 lens. So I'm going to shoot at F2.8 just to make sure that I'm capturing as much light as possible. The lower that F number, the, the larger the aperture and the more light that your lens is collecting. Uh, and then finally, the ISO. This one doesn't matter as much, but you know, of course we want the image to be bright enough that we can see it. 
Um, so I uh, usually suggest around ISO 3200 to ISO 6400. Um, this depends a little bit on your camera. Some cameras are better um, at certain ISO settings, um, but that range is usually very, very safe for night photography. Um, it's not going to be so high that you're completely blowing out, you know, like the blight, the bright uh, light polluted areas. Um, but it's not so low that you're going to be um, coming out with an image that's just too dark. If you go too low, if you end up shooting at an ISO like ISO 100, it'll actually be so dark that the the um, uh, you, you won't even be able to see anything on your LCD. And uh, most cameras tend to actually be a little bit noisier if you're if you're all the way down at ISO 100 and you're shooting in these very, very dark conditions. So don't shoot at ISO 100. Don't be afraid to bump it up to 3200, 6400. I mean, some cameras are even uh, have their best night performance, like low light performance at ISO 12800, depending on what you have. So um, definitely something not to be afraid of uh, doing is bumping up that ISO. Okay, so uh, beyond the basic exposure, uh, there's a few things that we want to go through our camera menu and check. Um, the first and foremost, the most important one um, is to always shoot in RAW. Um, yeah. It's there. It, it adds so much flexibility when it comes to editing to be able to edit a RAW photo rather than a JPEG. Um, there's just more data saved in a RAW file. And when you have better data, it gives you things like better color and better control of the color. Um, and it, it's sort of like, it's like keeping the negatives of your old film camera. Um, you know, if you throw away the negatives and you're, and you're just stuck with the prints, um, you know, you're never going to be able to, to reprint and, you know, kind of get like the, you know, maybe a better version of the photo that you remembered. Um, so shoot and raw, that's, that's the, the first and foremost, uh, most important setting. Um, next up, white balance. It doesn't really <clears throat> doesn't really matter uh, what white balance you are using, um, but it's helpful if all if your white balance doesn't change throughout the night. So I always suggest that you use a, a manual white balance. Um, I tend to shoot with a daylight white balance. Um, it's just easy. Um, it also kind of gives you an idea of how much light pollution you end up having. If you're shooting daylight, light pollution will tend to to appear uh, fairly orange. Um, and that's actually what we calibrated our um, Pure Night uh, filter to work with is we suggest using a daylight white balance that'll give you the most neutral uh, shot out of camera, or at least close to neutral shot out of the camera. Um, of course, we can always change this later. So um, you know, if your shots are turning out too orange looking or too blue looking, not to worry because you're shooting in raw. So uh, white balance is not super important. Um, now, this, this next one, long exposure noise reduction, um, this one is particularly important for meteor shots. Um, and uh, the reason being is that when a camera has long exposure noise reduction enabled, it will actually take a second exposure with the shutter closed. Um, and it, it does that in order to record the noise profile of the camera, and then it subtracts. It does like basically some math on your image and it reduces the noise in that way. But the problem with that when shooting meteors is that if you're shooting a 20 second exposure, it's only exposing for 20 seconds and then the camera will sit neutral idle, taking that second uh, noise reduction frame without capturing the sky at all. So you have 20 seconds of time wasted that could have been capturing the meteors. So it's very, very important to disable this when you're trying to shoot the meteor shower um, turn long exposure noise reduction off, for sure. Um, other ones that are helpful to, to um, turn off are high ISO noise reduction. That's just sort of like a post-processing noise reduction that the camera can apply um, after the photo is taken. And it's essentially the same algorithm of noise reduction that is built into a program like Adobe Lightroom uh, or Adobe Photoshop or Camera Raw. When you enable noise reduction on on those software, um, you have, you have more control than you would in camera. Most cameras don't even have uh, a way to adjust the noise reduction if you have it on uh, in camera. I'd say for a few, I think like Fujifilm uh, has an adjustment for it. But uh, once it's baked into your file, uh, you know there's no unbaking it. So it's better to just do it in post processing. If you're shooting in RAW, most of the time this setting won't, won't apply. Um, it'll actually only apply to like the preview. 
Um, so that's helpful, but it, it depends on the camera. So I, I would just suggest turning it off. Um, and then uh, the final setting in camera is that image stabilization, uh, turning it off. If your camera has that enabled and you're shooting on a tripod, there is the slight possibility that it could start to drift um, during a shot and it could blur the stars. It really depends on the camera and the lens, um, but it's the safest thing to do is to turn that off. Um, and then finally, the interval timer. We talked about this earlier. Um, usually you want the interval to be about two seconds longer than the shutter. And, uh, and then the other option that I had mentioned is where you could put your camera on continuous mode and just hold the shutter down with the hold, uh, the hold function on your, uh, on your remote, um, it, you know, assuming that that's an option. But the best thing is just to have a regular interval timer and program that interval in. Okay, a um, couple last tips when you're out there and you're shooting in the dark, things to think about. Um, minimizing the use of your headlamp. This is more of a, a courtesy, I guess, if you're out there shooting with other photographers. Um, you know, when you turn on a headlamp, it's probably going to spill over into their photograph. So anything that you can do to be prepared enough to not have to use that uh, is very, very helpful. And so um, I always like to recommend that people uh, know how to change a few things or know how to access a few things on their camera by feel. Uh, one of those is, is changing your camera LCD brightness, being able to turn that down. Um, that's especially helpful for conserving power while you're shooting. Um, you know, the brighter the LCD on the camera, the more power it's going to end up using. So, um, you know, figure out how to turn that down. That way, once you, uh, you know, once you're set up and you, you've got your time lapse going, you can turn down that LCD brightness just to make sure that your camera is going to last throughout the night. I know that my Sony cameras, they leave the LCD on when it's shooting a time lapse. There's like no way to turn it off. So the best thing to do to save power is to at least lower the brightness. Um, and uh, w one, of the, one of the tools that, uh, that I think is helpful, one of the practices that you can do is see if you can figure out where your buttons are in your camera without looking at it. Like close your eyes and figure out like how to hit the playback button to check your focus. Um, you know, how do you uh, zoom, zoom in the live view uh, in the dark without having to, you know, uh, to actually see where the buttons are on your camera. So, you know, sort of knowing the positions of those buttons and getting used to where they are by feel is an easy way to, to be able to minimize your use of a headlamp uh, while you're out shooting. Um, and one of the things that we always encounter uh, when we're out on like workshops, you know, like for instance, the photo pills camp is uh, tripods. And this is, this is like maybe the, I would say the, the most important skill to know to preserve the value of your gear because uh, it's very common for people to set up their tripod and have it tilted one way or the other and then they brush it or something as they're fiddling in their bag and they knock over their tripod and you know crack their lens or you know get dirt in their camera. Um, so get used to, to what it's like to actually level your tripod um, many tripods have a built-in uh, bubble level, um, or just just get used to doing it by eye. If it doesn't have a level, you you know you have a pretty good gauge um, just by eyesight of what's up and what's down. So um, you know, get used to leveling your tripod uh, because once it gets dark, uh, things get a little bit you know more difficult. And the last thing that you want to do is accidentally uh, have your camera fall over. So. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, we, we have a few questions here. You don't mind? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. That? Yeah, sure. Uh, Thomas Lolaik is asking us if uh, do you use like uh, or take uh, dark frames? Uh, um, so uh, that's a good question. Um, for the meteor shower, um, you could take dark frames if you wanted to. Um, you would want to do it after you're done shooting for the night, like right after you finish. Um, then you could you could capture some dark frames. And and so what Thomas is talking about dark frames are a special type of exposure that we make uh, after we do our shooting for the night. Um, we can basically put our our uh, lens cap on our lens um, and then start our interval timer again to take the same type of exposures that we were taking throughout the night. Uh, they need to be the same settings, the same shutter time uh, and ISO in particular. 
And um, what these dark frames let us do af uh, after the fact in post-processing is we can combine those together and then subtract them from our image. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail uh, about that. I, I, I wasn't planning on doing that for our uh, post-processing section of this uh, presentation, um, but uh, it, it, it is a technique that can help. Um, it's, yeah, uh, I, I would not not suggest it, but it's definitely not necessary for, uh, for this type of shooting. Awesome, awesome. Uh, another question from Miguel Angel Martí. Uh, can we have any kind of noise due to overheating of the sensor? Um, it's not something that you really have to worry about. Um, I mean, you know, if I speak sort of generically about cameras in general, yes, uh, longer exposures tend to warm up the sensor and result in the occurrence of, you know, more noise. Um, that said, uh, most modern cameras are very, very good at uh, handling those situations. Um, I've shot time lapses with 30 second exposures that lasted eight hours, you know, on, on a warm summer night, um, you know, where it, it was like 90 degrees at night in the desert. And I've had no issues, um, you know, with, with the resulting photographs. Um, you will potentially see a slight increase in the amount of noise uh, that you have, um, but you know it's not something that I would say should deter you from going out and shooting. Um, you're definitely not going to damage your sensor um, by shooting long exposures. Um, yeah, like I said, I've, I've shot you know hundreds of thousands of photographs on any given camera body, um, all super long exposures, and had no issues. So not something to super worry about. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Be before we jump into the, the focusing, how to focus and get mm -hmm. everything sharp, uh, when do you take like the, the, the base photo? I mean, you take photos from the, for the sky and also you take a, a photo for the program, I suppose. What, what's the best time to, to shoot it? Uh, some, some people are suggesting it. Tony, for example, uh, told me that uh, you can take it during the astronomical twilight before you start shooting. Uh, what's your preference? Oh. Um, uh, I guess I'm trying to understand the question. Like, um, yeah. <laughs> do you mean, do you mean like a foreground, like a separate foreground exposure? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. You... So I, I wasn't planning on getting into, uh, doing exposure blending, but, um, that is a technique where if you're in, if you're in a place where the foreground is very, very dark, yeah. um, and you're not you're not having uh, you know you're having difficulty getting a lot of detail in that dark foreground, yeah. then you can expose uh, uh, a, a much longer exposure first before you start your regular shooting, um, so that you can capture uh, more detail in the foreground. And um, so usually we're talking about something like uh, in a very dark place it would be like a four minute exposure instead of twenty seconds. Yeah. Um, and my preference, if I'm doing an exposure blend, well, which is not super common, but if I am doing it, I want to do it as close to the time of shooting, um, okay. you know, for the stars, because I want I want the sort of natural balance of light um, in there. So I would tend to shoot for more of a, uh, you know, still shoot while it's dark rather than blue hour. Just yeah. use a really long exposure. Uh, you know, like several minutes in order to capture, you know, what that scene looks like in the dark. Um, but you, you'll see like um, a lot of photographers uh, like to combine, you know, maybe the soft light of blue hour, um, you know, around twilight where there's still a little bit of glow in the sky from the setting sun. Um, you know, that way they can get really, really uh, clean detail yeah. on the foreground. Um, that does present some difficulties in matching colors and, you know, making sure that it looks natural. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a little bit more complex of a topic, but I tend to like to shoot my foregrounds, uh, like at the same, you know, time of night, essentially as, as my base exposures for the night sky. Um, but most of the time, um, I'm just using regular 20 second exposures. Awesome. And then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stack them together. And what we're going to do essentially a, a sort of form of stacking um, 
uh, when we do our, our post-processing section uh, of this class, so. Perfecto. Thanks okay, so, much. so uh, focusing, uh, like you mentioned, yeah. uh, th there's some basic methods for um, focusing at night. Um, the first and foremost, like the one that, that is used most often on the fly is just using the live view of your camera, um, you know, using the, the feed on the back of your LCD and zooming it in using the magnification function and zoom it in on, on the brightest star that you can find in the sky. So not worrying about your composition or anything, just look around the sky, find that brightest star and put it right in the center of your frame and then, and then magnify uh, that live view so that you can focus. And uh, you know, you're basically trying to adjust your focus very gradually until you see um, the stars looking as pinpoint as possible. And one of the things I like to mention is that it's, it's often very helpful to, um, when, when, you're, when you're doing that, when you're looking on your live view, is don't necessarily look at just the brightest star. See if you can see a few of the dimmer stars around it. Because if you're slightly out of focus, those dimmer stars will start to disappear. Um, so that can be like a secondary gauge for figuring out if you're in focus. If, you know, like in, in, in this case, there's like a very dim star here that I can barely see when it's in focus, but it's almost gone when I'm just very slightly out of focus. So that's like a good gauge um, for, for, for trying to find focus at night. Um, the other one is to use some sort of tool to assist. Use a flashlight, headlamp, your friend, your wife, uh, mm -hmm. your husband, have them uh, walk out with a light uh, at a you know fairly large distance. Um, if, if they're greater than um, about 100 feet or like 30 meters away, um, that's gonna be far enough away that your focus point, um, if you focus on them, it'll be pretty much the same as the stars. And so that's a really good way to gauge infinity focus, especially mm -hmm. when you're shooting on a wide angle lens. Um, as long as it's far enough away, um, you know, if you have like a distant light to focus on, that should be perfect for uh, achieving good focus on the stars as well. And then the last method is that tool that I had mentioned earlier. Um, this is called the Sharp Star. Um, I don't know if, uh, can, they, can uh, the stream see me on, on camera? Uh, yes. You know? <clears throat> so um, this is a, uh, you can see it's a, very, it's a clear piece of plastic, it's a little hard to see. Um, <laughs> It's basically a, uh, a focusing filter is what we call it, basically. It's, a, it's, a, it's based off of an idea uh, used in telescopes called a Botanov mask, uh, which is normally this piece of uh, black plastic that goes over a telescope, and it helps astronomers focus on the stars. And so uh, we actually essentially uh, modified that idea, and we invented a way to make a Batinov mask work on uh, a regular camera lens. Um, and so the, the Sharp Star, what it does is it has these etched um, lines in it, and they use the concept of diffraction to essentially bend the light uh, that's coming into the camera. And what happens is it creates this uh, set of spikes, which you can see on the right side of the screen there, um, around a bright star. And I'll, I'll go ahead and show that a little bit closer. So uh, as I focus back and forth with my uh, focus ring ring on my lens, uh, the spikes around the star shift and there's a central spike and then uh, two outer spikes. And the two outer spikes move differently than the center spike. So as you focus, you can align the spikes together. And when they're perfectly aligned center to center, then you're, you have perfect focus. So, you basically uh, slide this into your filter holder in front of your lens, um, zoom in on the star, and then adjust your focus until the spikes line up. And then when you're done uh, getting them lined up, you just remove the filter and then go on shooting for the rest of the night, and you'll have perfect focus on the stars every single time. Um, so we, we sell this on lonelyspec.com. Um, it comes in a few different sizes for different filter holders. And um, we also have a 100% guarantee on it. So um, because different lenses and different equipment all kind of have different ways of showing live view, um, there are a few, uh, you know, cases where maybe this tool won't, you know, work perfectly for you. 
Um, and if that's the case, then we'll just give you, you know, we'll give you a refund. You just send us an email because, um, you know, we want to make sure that we can get this tool out to as many people as possible. And, you know, I mean, 99% of our customers love it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's there's really no risk in trying it out. Definitely check it out on LonelySpec.com. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a great tool. We use it all the time. And we have a ton of people that really love using it. So, uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's very clever because uh, you're right. I mean, uh, in the Flipwheels camp, any workshop we do, uh, we see a lot of people having a really hard time to, to, to focus on the stars and getting the, the, the stars in focus. So this tool, it seems like makes things uh, easier. The first time I, I didn't know this, uh, you invented this, this, uh, this filter. It's uh, really surprising. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, you know, I stand by it for sure. Yeah. It's a, it's a fun tool to use, and okay. uh, it definitely you know works pretty well. So, nice, nice. focusing is the hardest. Uh, it's the hardest thing. Um, like, I, it, it's something that uh, you know, even even after you know doing astrophotography for you know, I guess, how old am I now? Like almost two decades. It's like. Uh, it's one of those things where every once in a while you bump your focusing ring and you didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go and you shoot a time lapse and your whole time lapse is out of focus. Um, and so I have to constantly remind myself, oh, double check, you know, double check the shot. Because even if I use the sharp star and I did my focus, if I did something like change my composition and I accidentally bumped that focusing ring yeah. on the lens, um, you know, that can just completely destroy a night of shooting. Um, so. Um, you know, beyond just, you know, beyond using a special tool for focusing, just scrutinize it, you know, just double check, like go back and review your photo after you took it and just make absolute sure that that's in focus because you, you don't want to go on and shoot another hour of it being out of focus. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially for, for the meter showers, you really need to make sure that when you're taking your test shots, you get everything, uh, you, you get the focus you want because when you start the camera, you know, <laughs> You yeah. stop it after four hours of shooting and discover that your images are all blurred. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely the most disappointing thing. Um, it's funny too because, like, I, I even even during um, the photo pills camp, um, there was one night where uh, I set up a time lapse at the beginning of the shooting session, and we had you know a bunch of workshop participants. And I was like, okay, I'll just set up this great time lapse. And, you know, I checked everything. I, you know, I thought I checked everything and, I, you know, I was pretty confident and I must have bumped the focus ring and I started my time lapse and I went on to go help people for like two hours. And I was so excited about that time lapse too. And, uh, and it came back with nothing that night. I mean, luckily I helped, you know, I helped the other participants, participants get their photos, but uh, I got nothing that night. So yeah, scrutinize yeah. your focus as often as you, as you can. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so lonelyspec.com, that's where you can uh, get that filter. Um, and you can check out all of our tutorials, obviously. And if you want to follow kind of the lifestyle that um, Diana and I have uh, and see, you know, stuff from our travels, we haven't been traveling lately because of COVID, um, but you can sort of, you can check out all of, of that information on our travel blog, which is north to south.us. Um, so, <coughs> Are you going to uh, release or post uh, videos on your YouTube channel? Because you you also have like a lot of videos on YouTube. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. Lon um, YouTube.com slash LonelySpec. You can actually, you can access that through LonelySpec.com. Um, we have all of our video tutorials there. Um, you know, everything's free. And mm -hmm. uh, we actually just recently released an old uh, post-processing workshop video on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have everything from like, how to photograph the Milky Way in five minutes um, to, you know, advanced, uh, you know, stacking uh, videos and, and uh, you know, and then some just, you know, kind of more inspirational stuff about our travels, you know, to mm -hmm. places like New Zealand, for example. Um, so, yeah, definitely check out youtube.com slash lonely spec. Yeah, yeah, New Zealand, yeah. Such a great place to go and shoot the stars. <laughs> yeah, awesome. yeah, one of my favorites. So I figured we would, could uh, kind of shift. You know, we talked all about the shooting, focusing. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk about processing next. Does that sound good? That'd be great. 
So uh, this is the photograph that we're gonna try it, try to make basically uh, today. And so I'm gonna go over here and uh, and kind of show you what it took to create this photograph. Like I said, there's about 20 or so meteors in this shot. Um, and, uh, and so I wanna show you kind of like all of the photographs that I took that night in order to try and make that shot. Um, so I've pulled them up here. Um, and I've selected some for you guys to see. And I, I think if I select, if I show you the ones that I selected, uh, let's see how many. So I have 200, 201, actually 200 uh, exposures. The one is, is, uh, is a, a separate edit. So I, I took 200 exposures here that night. And if we, if we look at, at uh, some of the data for this photograph, um, oh, it was actually a 13 second exposure. So I can tell you, um, I probably shot 13 seconds and I probably had an interval of maybe 15 seconds. So only about two seconds between each shot. Uh, ISO 6400. And I was using a manual lens. So the lens data is not coming up on here. Um, I was actually shooting um, that night on a 24 millimeter lens, which is considered a wide angle. Um, and I shot at F2, uh, I believe. Um, so fairly wide open trying to capture as much light as possible. Um, now, the interesting thing about this, you know, these shots is that, you know, you don't see any meters in this exposure. And I can actually scroll through all these exposures and you don't really, oh, wait, there was one. So scrolling through that time lapse that I took at night, um, you know, it, it took a while before I even saw one meteor. Um, like I think we're on, uh, we're on the 17th exposure I took that night. And so at, at you know 13 seconds, like I, that's like several minutes that I had to wait before I actually got one meteor. And it looked, you can see that there was a car driving by at the same time, and it lit up the uh, the, the foreground of the cliffs. Um, so you know that sort of gives you like an idea of like what to expect when shooting a meteor shower. You're not going to get a meteor in every single exposure that you're shooting. It's going to be um, potentially infrequent, you know, it might be every, like, you know, in this case, every 17th exposure, um, you might have long uh, sections where there were no meteors. If I, I scroll through here, you can see like every once in a while, while uh, a meteor flashes, um, there's, there's one. Um, and uh, you can actually see, I actually encountered a problem uh, that night. My lens started fogging up. Um, this is maybe something I should have mentioned uh, in the equipment equipment section, um, <clears throat> uh, when we leave our camera outside at night, it can cool down um, very, very cold. And if there's any moisture in the air, uh, moisture likes to stick to cold things like cold glass, kind of like if you have if you have a water glass with you know with ice water in it, it starts to you know sweat or whatever. That's all you know condensation from the air. Uh, you know, condensing on the cold surface of the glass. And the same thing happens to our camera at night. Uh, the camera can actually get colder than the air um, just because it's sitting out, you know, essentially looking out to space. Um, space sort of acts like a, like a, uh, they call it a black body, basically a black body radiator. It, it sucks the heat out of things. Um, and so your camera can get very cold and then it can start to fog up. And so I had a, an issue with fogging uh, on this nice night and I didn't bring a dew heater, which is a um, It's basically like a little band that you can put around your lens. Uh, you can find them on like amazon.com or B&H and um, You wrap it around your lens and it has a built-in heating element You plug it into a battery and it, it keeps your lens warm. So I would suggest that in areas that are particularly cold or um, or particularly moist, you know if it rained recently um, or if you're just in a humid environment, uh, a dew heater can be very helpful. You know, if you're shooting near the ocean, for example, like in Menorca, you're usually uh, somewhere near the shoreline. Um, a dew heater can potentially be helpful on a cold night. Um, we, we use it all, all the time. Yeah. It's, it's not really possible. So, um, uh, yeah, dew heater could be helpful. I ended up I, I realized that it was fogging up at one point because I saw dew forming on the surface of uh, the camera body. And so at, at some point during that, during the course of the thing, between the exposures, I quickly wiped my lens. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you, anything you can do to prevent that would be, uh, uh, you know, 
helpful for sure. So, you know, scrolling through, you can see there's only a few little flashes of, of meteors every once in a while. And then later in the night, uh, the moon starts rising and starts lighting, wow. up, uh, lighting up the, the foreground. Um, and I, I liked the real like the, this very last exposure that I made uh, that night. I really liked the light on the foreground from the moon and the really blue parts of uh, you know the blue sky. Um, so this is sort of like the base exposure that I wanted to use um, to do my edits. So what I do usually is I'll go through all my photos and I'll find the ones that have meteors in them, and then I'll mark them on, on Lightroom with five stars, or you know, just, just mark them somehow. So um, you can do that um, you know, when you're scrolling through photos and you find one with a meteor, you just press five on your keyboard, and they'll say set rating to five, so now it has five stars. So I went through um, ahead of time, and I marked all the ones that have meteors in them. And uh, uh, what we can do is we can filter our view. We can actually go up here to this top toolbar, and uh, we can select attribute, and then we can filter by five stars. So now I have all of the frames that have meteors in them. So there's one bright meteor in the middle. There's a little tiny one there slightly uh, on the left. It's barely visible. It's one on the top of the frame. Uh, I don't really see that one there. Some of them are, are kind of small. Uh, here's a brighter one in the middle. Yeah. So you can see, you know, I've, I've marked where all these meteors are. So now that we've ha we have all of those selected, we want to bring those into Photoshop so that we can, can uh, combine them all together into a single exposure. Um, so I've selected all of those. Uh, and I also have this final frame uh, here, which is uh, you know, the, the, the sort of base frame that I want all the meteors to be uh, uh, you know, visible in. And uh, you know, I, mostly because I like that foreground, the way that it's lit up. So I'm selecting all my exposures. I'm just holding down Shift and then clicking. Uh, and then I'm going to right click and go to Edit In, Open as Layers in Photoshop. And uh, this is going to take a minute here. So maybe this uh, could be a good time to answer a question because it has to load into Photoshop. Um, and that might take uh, a minute or yeah. two to open Very it. Good. We have a few. <laughs> Few questions. Uh, Steven Morales is asking if you're using a, a tracker, star tracker, or no. Do you have any experience? Yeah, um, I have experience using a star tracker. Um, I used to have one um, called a Vixen Polari, um, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a whole bunch more on the market now from companies like iOptron or Skywatcher, um, and. I personally don't use star trackers, um, mostly because of the equipment burden. Um, I like to make sure that when I'm going out shooting, um, I don't have to worry too much about my equipment and, and um, you know, getting it, like lugging it out to where I want to go, um, especially if the location is fairly remote. Um, uh, I'm, I need to check on this for some reason. It's not, it, it stopped loading. Let me, uh, Take your time. Yeah, it only it only opened like a few. I also have a I have a save file that I might be able to open if this is not working. Uh, open layers in Photoshop. Hopefully this works out. <clears throat> anyway, so with the star tracker, um, yeah, for me it's like more of an equipment thing. Like I don't want to have to carry another piece of gear that's as heavy as my camera and lens. Um, that said, it can be very helpful. Um, especially if you're if you want to shoot um, really long with really long lenses, you know, shooting nebula or uh, you know even galaxies and stuff like that. Um, you know, the longer the lens that you have, the more you have to worry about things like star trailing from the Earth rotation. And so, having a star tracker mount to mount your camera on um, tracks the stars. It lets you do much longer exposures. Um, but for something like meteor showers, um, it's definitely not explicitly necessary. Um, I wouldn't use it in, in my case. I would just use a regular tripod. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Great. We have another question Yeah, from Jamie Feldman. Uh, do you ever use light painting for the foreground? Or? Uh, well, in this case, I inadvertently used somebody else's light painting because we had the cars driving by. Um, so the, mood, uh, the, the answer is yes, uh, definitely sometimes. Um, 
Uh, light painting is one that uh, it can be very challenging um, to get to look right. And um, and I would suggest if you want to do it, if you know, especially if you have a very dark foreground and you you uh, you know you really want to kind of give it some some oomph. Um, Try and have your friend light paint for you. Um, bring a friend with you and try to have them stand um, to the side of whatever it is you're light painting or even slightly behind. And the reason I say that is um, because of the way that light falls on things uh, with a flashlight, um, we're talking about a very small point of light and if it's too close to the camera, it'll make that foreground, the lit foreground look very, very flat. So uh, it, it's much more helpful to have like a nice angle on that light. So that, that's the only suggestion that I would have if you do uh, want to use light painting um, is uh, try to find a nice extreme angle for that light. Um, and the best way to do that is with, a, with the help of a friend. Awesome. Do you have time for another question or? Yeah, we can take one more. Um, okay. I think I just finished loading, but let's take one more. Okay. Uh, David Caruso Radin is asking: Is it possible to capture the Neowise comet and the Perseids together? I would think so. Um, I don't know what its visibility will be like in one week, because um, it is uh, the comet is moving farther and farther away, and um, you know. But but the Neowise is still visible in the general direction of where the Perseid. Um, uh, radiant point is, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, like the Perseid. If you're looking north, the Perseid yeah. radiant point will generally be slightly north east, and then Comet uh, Neowise will be slightly northwest. So if you have a very wide angle field of view, you could potentially get the radiant point and the the uh, the comet in there. But I don't know how bright it's going to be by the time we get, yeah. you know to the peak of the Perseids. Um, but uh, you know, our cameras collect more light than our eyes. So even if it's not visible with your eyes, it might still be visible in your photograph. So I, I mean, I would give it a try for sure. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's possible. Um, but yeah, I think it depends on how bright the comet ends up <laughs> in a week, so. Great, uh, and, and we have a one, very good one, and I wanna ask it. Is yeah. it from George uh, Priotesa? How can you tell uh, meteors from satellites, flares, or yeah? Uh, that's a really good question. Planes. <laughs> there are so many. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny because I thought about that uh, when I was preparing my photographs, and I was like, I thought briefly, I was like, oh, I should show a photograph that has like a plane in it, or yeah. whatever. But of course, those photographs are like the ones that I don't care about ever because they're you know like ruined by the plane. Um, it makes me wonder. I don't know if I have anything prepared for it, but okay. Uh, using this photograph that we have pulled up here as an example, um, let me sort of show you what the typical meteor looks like. Um, they are very fast. So they only last, you know, I mean, if you've ever seen a shooting star, that's what we're talking about. Um, they only last a second or two, you know, half a second or a quarter second. They're very, very quick. You know, it's just like a quick blip across the sky. And so if you see this streak in your photograph and that same streak shows up in the next photograph moving across the sky, then it's mm -hmm. definitely not a meteor because it's, it's only usually, um, it's so fast that it's, it's, it can only sort of exist in one of your frames at a time. Uh, and if it, if it seems to go across multiple frames, you know, when you scroll through your time lapse, uh, then it's probably a satellite or a plane. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in the case of a meteor, they tend to have this profile where they appear like they fade, uh, they fade in, you know, fairly dim, and then they get bright in the center, and then they fade out. And that, that tends to be the case. Um, sometimes you can get lucky if, uh, you know, depending on how like large the meteor is, or if it had like gases mm -hmm. inside of it or something like that. And then it, if it exploded, you know, like a fireball, then sometimes you get a really bright blip in the center of the of the meteor. Um, I don't have any fireballs in this particular uh, shot that we're working on, but um, they tend to have that profile where they start dim, get bright in the center, and they get dim again. Um, and an airplane most often will look like a solid line of constant brightness, 
And sometimes if you're looking really closely, you can see the strobe lights on the, on the you know, like the anti-collision lights on the plane blinking. Mm -hmm. uh, so they'll make a little blinky trail across. So that, that's kind of how you can tell uh, if it's an airplane. Um, so yeah, Great. I think that's the general, uh, the general gist of whether or not it's a meteor or not. Um, so looking at these photographs here, um, you know, we marked all our frames, brought them into Lightroom, and um, I imported all of them into layers. So looking over on the right side here, you can see I've got all these layers. And in each of these layers, I have a meteor somewhere. Um, and we want to sort of combine those together so that we can see them all in the same frame. That way we're capturing you know, where all those meteors were for the night. Um, on the very bottom, I'm going to show you that my bottom layer, I'm going to turn off all of these layers. On the very bottom of our frame, we have the frame that I want to use as sort of my base exposure, the one that all the meteors are going to be uh, brought into. Um, and so depending on, on how you've imported your photos, you might have a base layer that you prefer, you know, depending on the light of the foreground or you know, just the look of the shot. Um, bring that layer all the way to the bottom. You, know, you can just drag the position of it. Bring that all the way to the bottom of your layers palette. And um, just to make things easier, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rename this layer to base layer, um, just so I know that that's the one that I'm trying to composite into. Um, so uh, looking at all of these different layers, I'm going to turn them all back on again. Starting with the very first one, this was one of our most obvious uh, uh, meteors. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use a method called masking. Mm -hmm. and we're going to mask in each uh, meteor. And I do this um, with sort of like a method of inverse masking, where um, I'll add a layer mask. And the way we do that is we select the layer in the layers palette. So I've got the very top layer selected here, the one that, that we're viewing right now. And I'll click this button all the way down on the bottom right corner that says uh, Add Layer Mask. It looks like a rectangle with a little circle in it. So when I click Add Layer Mask, it adds this little white rectangle next to our layer. Um, and that's our layer mask. And uh, everything that's painted in white on the layer mask, you can see in the preview, it has a it's, everything is white. Everything that's white is visible. And everything that's black is invisible. So we're going to use a black brush. Um, so I'm going to go to the Brush tool over here. You can also select it by pressing B. And I'm going to use a, a small brush. And I'm going to go in on that meteor. And I'm actually going to paint it away. So mm. um, what it, the way that I like to do is I click on one end of the meteor. And then I hold down the Shift key. And I click on the end of the meteor. And then you can see that we've erased that meteor away. If I show you the, the layer mask, I can hold down Alt or Option and click on the layer mask. You can see that we just painted a black line to erase that meteor. Um, so what we're going to do is, now that that meteor is erased, we're going to select that layer mask. And then we're going to invert it. And mm -hmm. by inverting it, we're going to flip it around so that we can see the meteor again. And there's two ways that we can do this. The first one is we can do image, adjustments, and then invert. Um, and that, that's one way of inverting it. The other way to, to invert it is by just pressing Command-I or Control-I if you're on a, on a Windows uh, machine. So by pressing Control I, that'll invert it, and now we can see our meteor again. So mm -hmm. now what we're essentially doing is you can see that we've combined uh, this top layer meteor with the layer underneath it, and the layer underneath it has this other small meteor right next to it. Um, so you can sort of see where we're going with this. We're going to combine all these separate layers together, and I'm going to try and run through this fairly quickly so that you guys see it progress. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll talk about what I'm doing along the way. So now, now that I've done that, I'm going to actually turn that layer off so they don't start confusing meteors with each other. So um, to turn a layer off, there's this little eyeball icon next to your layer. I'm just going to click that, and that turns that meteor off. And I'm going to do the same thing with the next layer. So I select that layer, select the layer mask, uh, use the brush tool, and with a shift you know, click, shift, click. I'm going to erase that uh, meteor. And then I'm going to hit Command-I or Control-I to invert it. All done. And then we're going to move on to the next layer. I'll turn this layer off. And then looking at this next layer, it looks like the, the meteor is up here. Uh, I'll do the same thing. Add a layer mask. Paint it out. 
invert it with control I and then turn it off. Nice. Uh, yeah, so so you can see it's it's a little bit time consuming, um, but uh, you know I mean I only have twenty frames, so it's like not too bad. This particular frame here, it doesn't have I think the meteor that I was I was looking at is this very very dim one here, so I might not even include it. So I'm actually going to just uh, I'm just going to drag that one to the trash. So I'm, uh, you know that particular layer I, I don't think is really contributing. Um, here we have a meteor on this next layer, so. Add a layer mask with the black brush. Click once on the end of the meteor, and then hold down Shift and click again on the other end of the meteor. And then we can invert it, and then turn that layer off. Awesome. I think it's perfect. Uh, the method you're following is uh, crystal clear. I mean, you want to do it like a few more UV, and then yeah, just yeah. The yeah final so here's this little meteor. I added a layer mask to that layer. Uh, clicking again, holding down Shift, and then clicking. And uh, okay, and then uh, I invert it once I'm done to make sure that that uh, mask looks black. Command I, and you can see you know when it's properly inverted when you uh, uh, when you see that the layer mask appears black on the layers palette there. Um, so let's go ahead and go through. I, I want to do a couple more. Just find some of the the um, the brighter ones here. Um, so I'm going to go in there. Paint this one out, and then Command I, turn that off. Now this is a good one. Mm -hmm. Adding a layer mask, painting it out with a black brush. Command I, and then turning it off. Now this is a particularly good one. <laughs> Beautiful. Adding a layer mask to that, and then using that brush to paint it out. And then Command I to invert it and then turn it off. Um, okay, so just to kind of give you guys a preview of where we're going, all those layers that I turned off, if I turn them back on, you can see that now we have multiple meteors visible in the shot. Um, so you know that kind of gives you an idea of where we're going with this. So if I do another one here. Nice. And do you post process the, the whole, all the images before you on in Lightroom before you? Uh, yeah, I did very basic. I think I used one of the camera profiles on Lightroom, so mm -hmm. I just did a very basic edit with some contrast, but I didn't do a whole lot of edits in this case. Um, I didn't really want to focus on that too much, and you know, just so that we could focus more on on this whole compositing uh, method. So some of these ones don't really actually just seem to have like really bright meteors, so I'm going to skip them. Um, so we're actually getting through this fairly quickly. And one of the things that, that this workflow um, that I want to address is you can see as I advance through my frames, the moon is rising. And so my sky is getting bluer and bluer. Um, and you know that change presents a problem when we do these composites, because in one case, the sky is very dark black, and the other case, it's bright blue. So when we combine them together, we're going to have to um, uh, sort of address the fact that the colors between each frame are slightly different. And um, so that's one of the techniques that I want to go into here once we, uh, once we mask all of our uh, meteors in. Um, so I'm just repeating, if you guys are just joining uh, the stream and you're wondering what the heck I'm doing, <laughs> I am finding each of the meteors in my, in my layers. So I have multiple layers here finding the meteor, adding a layer mask to it, painting out that uh, meteor with a black brush, inverting the mask, uh, and, then, uh, and then turning off the layer and moving on to the next one. So finding the meteor in the next frame, adding the layer mask, uh, painting it out with a black brush using a shift click, uh, inverting that mask, and then turning that layer off. So we're just going through each frame, trying to find all the meteors, uh, that I captured that particular night, um, and you know these are this is a combination of uh, of basically the twenty best frames, or twenty or so best frames that I found um, from over two hundred that I shot this particular night. Nice. Okay. The, pro the process is super quick. It's fast. 
Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, it, it seems a little bit time consuming. Here's where you can see actually an issue of where when I painted it out, you can see the difference between the brightnesses in the layer underneath it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that we're going to start addressing here. I think we have a very last meteor here. Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. Uh, <laughs> this is exactly the process that you're going to need to go through on your meteor shots if you want a similar type of shot uh, compilation. Uh, you have 800 people here watching you. Uh, oh, great, great. Awesome. <laughs> live. <laughs> OK, so now we're back down to our base layer. So. Um, we can see all of our, our meteor um, shots have been masked out. We ha all have um, the black colored mask on each uh, layer. I'm going to turn all of those layers back on. So I'm just uh, clicking and dragging on the little eyeball icon. And you can see, uh, now we can see all of our layers, uh, or all of our meteors masked over our uh, base layer. And obviously, something looks not right. They, uh, the meteors that were taken earlier than the night have like this sort of dark, uh, you know, uh, mask around it, like a dark halo. Um, that's OK. Uh, nothing to worry about. That's normal. Um, because we had that change in light, because we went from a, a dark night to a slightly moonlit night, um, we have these differences in our frames. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to um, make some adjustments so that um, that's not apparent anymore. Um, so. What we're going to do is I'm going to select all of my layers. I'm, I'm clicking on the bottom layer, holding down Shift, and clicking on the top layer. And we're going to add them to a group. So I'm going to drag all those layers down to this bottom thing here that looks like a folder. And that's going to add them to a new group. And I'm going to call this group Meteors. So now you can see we have our base layer, and then we have our Meteors group. <clears throat> and uh, once we have the Meteors group, we're going to change a setting. Uh, on it, and that's called a blend mode. So you can see right now the default blend mode for a group is called pass through. It says it right here at the top of the layers palette. I'm going to drop that down, and I'm going to select a different blend mode called lighten. And what that's going to do is it's going to ensure us that only the bright exposed pixels are the ones that are visible, uh, mm -hmm. you know, from layer to layer, um, and that automatically makes the blending. Of the layer, much more natural. It's the you know essentially what we see with the regular uh, meteor exposures, um, and so you know that's how we combine all of them together. That's the basic gist of it. Now I would do w probably one last tweak um, on this particular shot uh, before I, I bring it back into Lightroom for my final edits, and that would be to make a slight adjustment to the brightness of the meteors. Um, just to try and pull them out a little bit um, to make them more visible against this like blue moonlit sky. And the way that I do that is by adding an adjustment layer. Um, so I, I'm using the adjustments palette here. Um, if you don't see the adjustments palette, uh, you can find it with uh, window and then uh, adjustments. Um, and if you want to use a workspace that looks like mine, I use the default workspace for photography. So you can actually go to window, workspace, and then select photography. Um, and that'll have all the same uh, you know, layers palette, the adjustments palette, and the histogram on there for you. So I'm going to use an adjustment layer called Curves. Um, it's the third one on the list here. So I'm going to just click that. And that adds a layer to the layers palette called Curves. And it gives us the uh, Curves adjustment tool. And um, normally, the way uh, an adjustment layer works is it applies to all the layers below it. And I don't want to edit my base layer, the base exposure. I only want to edit the, uh, the meteors layer. Uh, this is actually funny, because this is a trick that I uh, learned from Michael Shane Bloom during the <laughs> photo pills camp. Um, you can apply adjustment layer to only one layer if you want to. And I did not know this for the longest time. I don't know how this like escaped me. Um, but you can apply that adjustment layer to um, just the layer below it by holding down the Alt key or the Option key on the keyboard. And if you hover your mouse in between the two layers, you can see it, it comes up this little icon with a, little, uh, a square and a little arrow pointing down. And when, once that's uh, you know, visible, click, just click between the two layers. And it'll add that little arrow to the adjustment layer, meaning it's only applying to the single layer below it, um, in this case, our group. So any adjustments that we make will only apply to uh, you know, to that that group that uh, you know ha happens to contain all of our meteors. 
So what I'm going to do is uh, we can now adjust the brightness of our meteor using this curves tool. So if I bring up the brightness, you can see it makes the meteors brighter. Um, I don't want to go too crazy because you, we start to see the brush strokes that I made to mask them in. Um, so we can actually pull down uh, the shadows on the curves a little bit and try to you know come up with something that looks a little bit more natural uh, while still you know brightening up the 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 overall look of those meteors just to make them slightly more visible. And you know, depending on your conditions, you might have certain meteors that kind of look a little funky or you know, might be slightly different depending on the lighting conditions. You know, I had changing light in my, uh, in my particular, um, uh, you know, sh sh shooting this night. Um, and you know, one of the things I see like this meteor, this little tiny meteor in the center there is interfering with that larger one. Um, so I think I actually want to try and remove that one. So I'm going to go through and try to find out which layer uh, that one is on. So I, I drop down my uh, my meteors group, and I'm just sort of turning on and off my layers here to try and see if I can find that little one. I think it might might have been one of the ones toward the bottom. There it is, very last one. So I'm just going to turn that one off. You know, I, I didn't like how I was interfering with that one meteor, so I'll just throw that one in the trash. Um, <laughs> So now we have all those meteors there, and it's just a simple right. matter of saving your, your work. Um, and since we opened that via Lightroom, uh, once we save in Photoshop, it'll automatically bring that new saved file into Lightroom <clears throat> so that we can do some final edits on it. Um, but that is basically the gist of how to combine a whole nice worth of meteor shooting uh, into uh, a single frame. So you get this classic looking meteor shower shot. Um, awesome. This has been great, man. I mean, a super fast method of, you know, creating this uh, image with all the meteors you captured that day. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for sharing it. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I hope, I hope that was helpful, everybody. Um, I see a lot of comments in the chat. So I think people is very happy. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Um, well, I'd be happy, um, I think, to take any more questions that anybody has, um, particularly about shooting meteors. Um, this workflow that I showed you guys is a slightly simpler one. Um, uh, I know it wasn't, you know, it wasn't ultra simple, but uh, it's as simple as I could make it. Um, there are several other methods. Actually, if you, um, uh, if you're a Spanish speaker. And you check out the other photo pills uh, masterclass that was done by uh, Antoni Cladera. Um, it's it's all in Spanish. He uses a fairly similar method, but he also does something where he uh, yeah. he actually rotates all the meteors to be uh, relative to their position of the stars, so that they all appear to um, radiate from the same point. Um, and so he talks about that method in the. Uh, uh, in his master class. I didn't want to go into that much detail, especially if you guys are just starting out and you're shooting your very first meteor shower. Um, I think this method's a little bit simpler, um, you know, and, and hopefully isn't uh, too overwhelming of a post-processing technique for you guys to try. Yeah, and if you want to check uh, what Antoni did, you can go to the Spanish version of this master class. Uh, we just published it on, on Tuesday. And uh, in the description of the video, you have a, 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 a index time with the minutes, and there is a, there you'll find the time where he's doing the post processing, and it's, even if it's in Spanish, you can follow it. We have a lot of questions asking us how can you rotate the meteors and you know create a, that image. You have it there, unless he, if you want to do it here, feel free to do it. Is it yeah, I can, I, can sh I can show it real quick. Um, you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> We've been here for um, one hour, 40 minutes, 43 minutes. So Yeah, so um, in order to do this, uh, to do this demo, um, I'm going to just go ahead and show, um, I'll show a couple frames. Awesome. Thank um, you. And uh, so I'm going to sort of step back here and undo some of the work that I showed you during the post-processing section, uh, get and get rid of my layer masks here. OK, so in this case, I've got, uh, maybe this isn't the best layer. Let's try to find try to find a good one with a good meteor in it. Um, oh, I need to, I 
need to step back a minute here. Bear with me, everybody. Let me get this in a state where I can actually show you what's going on. Uh, By the way, Eric Pare is saying hi. Oh, is... hi, Eric. Uh, yeah. And happy uh, Fifth Tooth Tribe anniversary. Uh, <laughs> if you guys aren't familiar uh, with Eric Pare, um, he and Kim Henry make these amazing uh, shots uh, using light painting with tubes. Uh, yeah. uh, you can, I, I guess I don't, I don't, I don't know what their uh, their, their uh, website is off the top of my head. Um, share it in the chat, Eric, because I think everybody should check this out. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, his. Uh, the tutorials and YouTube channel that he has um, there are just uh, super helpful and you know just some amazing resources for learning how to do these amazing night photos uh, with with uh, light painting tubes um, okay I found two frames that I like okay so let's forget Eddie for a while <laughs> yeah uh, so if you guys want to um, maintain the position of the radiant point, between your shots, there's an extra step that you can do in the post-processing in order to try and maintain the relative position of the meteors to their position uh, in the sky relative to the stars, if that makes sense. Sorry, that was a mouthful. Um, so the way that we do that is um, by rotating or uh, transforming our layers so that they are aligned with the stars. Um, before we do our, our masking of the meteors. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this, uh, this one frame um, here where we have one meteor, and I want to combine it with this top layer um, here. But you can see between the two frames, the sky you know, appears to have moved because the Earth was rotating. So uh, what we want to do is we want to sort of manipulate one of the layers so that the skies line up before we do our composite. Um, and the way that we do that, um, there's a couple different ways you can do it. One of them is you could lower the opacity of the upper layer. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delete these, uh, these other layers just to move them out of the way so that you guys can see what I'm doing. Um, so I'm working with these two top layers. And uh, on the top layer here, I'm going to lower the opacity to around 50%. And so now we can see what's going on. We can sort of see here's one meteor here, and then here's the other meteor here. And you can see they're rotating all about uh, the central point. This happens to be the North Star. And if you guys are shooting the Perseids uh, next week and you want to include the radiant point, um, if you remember in the planning phase, the radiant point uh, for the Perseids was actually just a little bit to the right of the North Star as you're looking at the North Star it's to, to the northeast um, when you're looking north. So you're going to be shooting roughly towards the North Star anyway. And if you're shooting with a wide angle, you'll probably have the North Star in your frame. So this is a really good example of what to expect for the Perseids um, if you want to do this type, type of compositing. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, press Command-T or Control-T on the keyboard. Um, and that's going to enable the transform mode. You can also find that through, um, I believe, uh, layer and then is it under layer? Whereas I, I always go off with the hotkeys here. Um, actually, don't even know where it is for transform. Let's use a hot layer. Yeah, Command T, Command T, I, I, or Control T on the keyboard. Anyway, so Command T that that uh, that, uh, that opens up our uh, transform mode, and you know we get this box, um, and what we want to do is uh, yeah. people just commenting that it's in uh, the edit menu. It's in edit. Okay, yeah, yeah, edit transform, free transform. That's what we want. Okay, thank, thank you, you, thank you, uh, uh, <laughs> audience. So. Um, uh, when we enable transform, uh, make sure you have this checkbox checked uh, up on the top toolbar. That gives you the central point of the transformation. And we can move that central point around the image. And we want to move it over to that North Star. 
Um, so it's, it's very helpful that we have that uh, in, our, in our shot. And so now if we bring our cursor over to the outer periphery of the frame, we can see it transforms into this little, um, little arrow, like two directional arrow. Um, so that if we hold down, drag and click, it lets us rotate our frame. And so we just want to rotate it until our stars roughly line up. Um, so I'm sort of looking over at uh, Andromeda here, this really bright uh, thing in the sky. It's actually another galaxy as kind of my gauge. And we don't need to get it perfect. Um, you know, we, we just kind of need to get it roughly lined up. Um, and so now that that's aligned, uh, I can just hit enter and that'll complete the transformation. Um, I can return the opacity of our layer back to 100%. Uh, and then I can use the same masking method that we used before, which is where I select the layer, add the layer mask uh, by pressing this add layer mask button down in the bottom of the layers palette. Uh, and then I'll switch over to the brush tool and I'll go in here and I'll just uh, paint out our, uh, oops, uh, make sure I have this. Yeah, paint out our uh, meteor here. You can see there's, a, there's something weird going on here uh, and I'll, I'll show you what's going on. So after you paint it out, uh, we invert that la uh, layer mask. So with the layer mask selected, I hit Command-I or, or Control-I to invert it. And you can see uh, what happened here. Um, given that the Earth uh, was rotating and the sky appeared to move behind the horizon, that position of that particular meteor um, had it been in the, you know, occurred at the same time as, uh, as the upper meteor here, um, it actually would have been slightly behind our, uh, our cliffs. And so, um, you know, in this case, it's sort of appearing over uh, the cliff. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the, uh, what would you call it, uh, an artifact of our compositing um, and the fact that, you know, the sky moves between our frames. Um, that's okay. Um, you know, obviously we don't want it to look like that because that's not how it actually was. Um, so we can go into the, uh, have, with the layer mask selected, um, we can actually uh, modify our mask so it doesn't show up like that. So um, using a black brush, I have black selected and I've got the brush tool selected. We can just paint over with the layer, layer mask selected. I, you know, I have not the layer itself, but the mask. I have it selected. I'm just gonna paint out that area where the meteor is, is going over the edges of the cliff. Um, and so, you know, that's like the basic of compositing. And then, so you would follow that workflow for each and every layer, uh, you know, adjusting to your base layer, you know, doing the rotation, masking it in. Um, and then uh, if you remember, I did, uh, I did that final mask uh, of, right. of all the layers together. Uh, I'm sorry, I did the final group of all the layers together. So I select all those layers add them to the group, and then change the group blending mode to lighten. Um, and then we can add our, you know, our adjustment layer to, uh, to just the group, um, just to, you know, adjust the brightness of our, uh, of our meteors and try to get it to where, you know, it, it looks uh, natural. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of the, the gist oh. of it. Yeah. So if you did that with every single layer and you included the radiant points, uh, in your image, you know, using photopills, find the rating point in your, you know, include that in your composition, all of those meteors would appear to move from a single point in the image. Um, and if you check out, yeah, the Spanish version of this masterclass with uh, Antoni, um, you can see that in his composition, his composition included the radiant point. Uh, awesome, yeah. man, you did, did a great job showing the whole process. Uh, I think everyone, everybody's, Super happy now. <laughs> great, great. Did any are there any last questions before we close, or do you? you uh, yeah, we're good to go. We're, we're done with uh, most of them, and I, I I know you're busy. I don't want to take uh, more time from you. Nearly two hours now. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, it's been great here. Yeah, I don't know what to say. It's been a fantastic class. Where people can can find you? I mean, you mentioned lonelyspec.com. Yeah, um, you know, uh, yeah, lonelyspec.com is the best place. I mean, that's where you can find our, uh, you know, just all of our tutorials. And you'll find links to, like, our Instagram and, and, and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, you can follow us there um, and then, try, you know, find our travels on north to south. Um, I can bring that up here. 
Yeah. Yeah. So uh, those two websites, um, you know, visit us there. Uh, we've got contact <laughs> info if you guys run into any, you know, pressing questions or whatever, and you know, send us an email. Um, it's all on. It's all on those websites. So. Awesome. So, so guys, you know where you find you can find Ian and Diane. Actually, I want to take this opportunity to send a big kiss to Diane, who is watching you, Ian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's here. Uh, and this been this has been great. Uh, any last words you want to say before we, we say goodbye? Uh, I mean, thank you so much for you know uh, for organizing this and and putting together the stream and everything like that. You know, this is. I think it was really fun. I had a, I had a fun time putting together the, uh, you know, my workflow for the post processing because um, it's actually something that I haven't talked about directly on LonelySpec.com. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm glad to have uh, been able to put, you know, put that workflow together and share it with everybody. Um, you know, I hope it was straightforward enough for everybody. And uh, if it isn't, yeah. you know, shoot me an email and uh, yeah. ask me a question. So. I'm yeah. not a photographer, and, and I, I could follow you easily. So yeah, you did a great job, for sure. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rafa. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people from the Philippines camp is saying hi to. Yeah. We see great. Dima. Yeah, hey, everybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kiss, kiss. kiss. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, too, for uh, staying uh, here with us. And uh, that's it, guys. This is how you can, you know, imagine, plan, and shoot. The first day is next next, uh, next week. And I wish you a good luck. If you like this video, give, give us a like, <laughs> subscribe to the channel, click on the bell. If you want to get notified when we release the next video, which is going to be next week, I hope. And uh, yeah, as always, remember that you have the power to imagine, plan, and shoot. Legendary for us. Bye bye. Thanks, Rafa. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Ian. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody.